Thanks. You're awake. That's awesome. My name's John. You heard all the good stuff about me. <laughs> so I appreciate Brandon. That's humbling. You, you know when people, they say good things about you and talk you up, and you hear people say, that's really humbling. You're going, why is that humbling? Because, I mean, he said no, you should probably be, um, you, you know, big-headed now. And, and for me, and, and I think when people say that, they go, oh, that's humbling because I know the truth about me. <laughs> And I know all the stuff that he didn't say. And so it's true. Brandon and I have been friends for a long time. And uh, all that stuff he said about me uh, helping him is true about him helping me. And, and that's the way uh, God puts people together um, as iron sharpens iron, right? Uh, we, we are sandpaper for each other, in fact. We kind of rub off the rough edges a lot of times. And so it's good to be with you today. Brandon and I served at a church in Ohio together. We were both campus pastors at a large church in Ohio and um, that we spent a lot of time collaborating and, and doing things together ministry-wise in Ohio. And then there came a time where God was calling him away from Ohio. And he was just trying to really discern where God wanted him to go and what he should be doing. And all of a sudden, this place called uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi popped up on the radar. And I'm thinking, no, that's too far. <laughs> And uh, as God would have it, uh, he ended up here. We didn't want him to go. We love him. You know, we wanted to keep him for as long as we could. And um, we, but at the same time, we didn't want to hold him back. And so uh, I know that you're grateful for that. At least I think so. Uh, and it's been a good fit here. Yeah, I think that's worth. I mean, he's a good dude with a big heart. And so you got a good pastor. You really do. You got one of the really good ones. And so sometimes we do that. We, we hold on to things and it holds us back. If you found that to be true in your life, do you know, let's do it this way. Do you know people in your life that are holding on to things and you're thinking, man, that's holding you back. You need to let go of that. You know anybody like that? How many of you are sitting next to somebody like that right now? Don't, don't. Because we don't want to admit it ourselves, right? We do that. We hold on to things that hold us back. I want to talk about that today a little bit. But first, welcome to week two of this series called Greater. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go online and watch Brandon's message because he talked about who Jesus is and the fact that Jesus is greater and that God wants greater things for you. He wants bigger things for you. He's got good things for you. In fact, he's got greater things for you than you could ever imagine or come up with or dream for yourself. That's how much he loves you, and that's what he wants for you. He wants you to have life and life to the fullest because of someone who's greater, Jesus Christ. So I want to continue that theme today, the idea that God wants more for you, that he has greater for you. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 2, we're going to read there, beginning in verse 12. It'll come up on the screen. You can follow along. Here's what it says. After this, he went down to Capernaum. This is talking about Jesus. With his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them out of the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of, of the money changers and he overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered what is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? In other words, who do you think you are? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, this big, massive, impressive temple. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. 
This was really confusing to them because here's what they said. It's taken 46 years to build this temple. 46 years. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled, they remembered that he had said this. And then they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. That's my hope for us today is that you'll hear truth the truth of God's word, something will resonate with you, something will click, and you'll believe it. And so, let's talk about what we just read there. Many of you have heard that story in the Bible before where Jesus overturns the money changers tables and all that. And as you can see from what we read there, Jesus goes into the temple and he's not having any of it. This is not the sweet little baby Jesus caricature that you think of sometimes. This is not Jesus meek and mild. We see Jesus angry here, and he drives out the money changers. Now, sometimes people think this is a story that just is supposed to mean for us, like, you shouldn't have currency in church. You shouldn't sell things or do business in church. And, and what Jesus is getting at, and it's important to know this, is something much deeper than that. Because the temple was a picture of something that was of profound importance to God. Now, last week, Jesus talked about, like I just said, Jesus offering life and life to the fullest. That's what God's desire is for you and me. Uh, from the beginning of time, in the Garden of Eden, in fact, uh, that was meant to be lived with God. And then sin isolated us from God. So God gave the temple as kind of a picture of his desire that he has to be with his people. And that had been fulfilled by Jesus. And that's why Jesus talks about himself being the temple, the, the new temple, in fact. Or why he talks about tearing the old temple down and rebuilding it in three days, referring to his resurrection. Now, see, it's important to know that in Old Testament times, people would go to the temple to meet with God. That's how the system worked. And they, they would have to go through a high priest even. They didn't even have direct access to God themselves. And what Jesus is saying here in this moment, what he's demonstrating is, yeah, we're done with that. We're, we're done with that system because I'm here now and I'm going to introduce something brand new, something greater. And what he's saying now is you can have direct access to God the Father through me. Now, what happens is that when he goes into the temple, he says, this was designed to be a house of prayer for all nations. He says, you've made it into a den of thieves. And part of what we all need to understand about the temple is that there were courtyards in the temple, and these courtyards were designed to keep certain people out. In fact, there was a courtyard for the Gentiles, and if you were a Gentile, you couldn't go beyond a certain part. You weren't allowed to go as far as some of the Jewish people were. That was designed to keep people out. There were places that women couldn't go in the temple. If you were unclean or a leper or diseased, you were kept out. By the way, have you ever felt that way about church? Have you ever felt like it's just a place for the good people? Maybe that's your story at one time. You're like, man, yeah, maybe you said this or you, you know people have said this. If I ever set foot in a church, what would happen? <laughs> Catch on fire. Lightning would strike. You've heard, you may have said that. Maybe it's your first time here today and you walked in and you're like, if that's you, we're glad you're here. And guess what? Lightning didn't strike because, because the, the, new, the new, we're going to talk about this, the new system that Jesus brought, the new thing that Jesus brought, the greater thing is that we all have access to God, that it's, it's for everyone. Church isn't for the good people. In fact, if you turn to either side of you right now, you're sitting next to somebody that's probably out sinned you 10 to 1. I mean, let's just be real here. That way you know, like, okay, we're all in the same boat, Right? That's how it worked back in the day, that they had these places that were designed to keep people out. And Jesus says, yeah, we're done with that. Everyone, everyone now has access to God the Father through me. Because Jesus says God's intent was that the kingdom of God was for all nations, for all peoples. And anytime that doesn't happen, anytime people get excluded... Anytime people get oppressed, anytime the poor are exploited for money, which is what was happening in the temple when Jesus got angry, 
Jesus comes in, anytime that happens, he comes in to both literally and figuratively shake things up. Because ultimately what's going on here is the people in those days, they were holding on to things that were holding them back. And Jesus knew that, and Jesus came to do something about that. And can I just say that that's so true about you and me. I know I said it at the beginning, but we hold on to things that hold us back. Why do we do that? Now, oftentimes we know. We know better. Yet we hold on to things that hold us back. You, you know we do this in church too. I mean, like I'm talking like in church world. And if you're not a church person or you've had a bad church experience and you don't really like Christians and maybe you've got a really good reason for that and you have this tendency to resist church, this is the perfect series for you to be a part of. I think you're going to find that, like I alluded to earlier, we're just kind of like normal people that just we're trying to get it right. And we don't always. But I want to help you with some context in all of this that we're talking about and all this temple talk. I want to introduce you to a concept called the temple model. And here's what the temple model is. It basically represents all ancient religions. In fact, pretty much represents many of the religions that are part of the world today. The temple model goes way back, all the way back to Egypt, Assyria, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jewish temple system, which is what we read about here, and on and on. You, you could really kind of call the temple system, the temple model, religion in general. It kind of represents that. But the temple model always has four components, and here they are. I'm going to give them to you. The temple model has sacred places, sacred texts, sacred men, and sincere followers. Now, I don't know that sincere was the best word for that, but I wanted them all to start with S. So that's what you get today. I guess I, I could have said superstitious followers. And some of you know what I'm talking about when I say that. So you have those four components. In the, in the temple model, you always have a sacred place. And how somewhere in that sacred place are sacred texts. And those sacred texts are controlled by, interpreted by, read by sacred men. And these sacred men tell all the followers, all the believers of whatever that religion is, they say, here's how you're supposed to live your life. And if you don't live your life that way, God will judge you and God will punish you. And in some cases, they threaten you with hell. So the temple model is alive and well today. It's alive and well all over the world, in every region of the world, in virtually every religion. But it also still happens in the modern day church. Now, would you agree with me that there are so-called sacred men or sacred people that say things like, if you don't do this, then this will happen to you. If you do, do, do this, then this will, get, will happen to you. If you don't do this, you're going to hell. Or if you do this, you're going to hell. And anyone that can stand up and say, if you don't do this, you go to hell, that person has a lot of power. In fact, the temple model grants extraordinary power to sacred men in sacred places that determine the meaning of sacred texts. Now, you might look at that and go, well, John, isn't that exactly what's going on here? I mean, when I come to church here on Sundays, isn't that what we have? I mean, we got a sacred place, and then Brandon gets up here with a sacred text, and he's saying, hey, here's what the Bible says, and here's what it means, and when I read it, <laughs> when I read it, I don't get any of that. Right, when I'm just reading, Brandon did all that, but how'd you get that, Brandon? Wow. And then he throws in a Greek word, and you're just like. <laughs> and then he gets into like some Hebrew, and you're just like, just for context to help us understand it better. And you're just like, what, Greek, Hebrew, why am I even reading an English Bible? What's going on here? You got to know Greek for crying out loud. And then he does some kind of twist at the end, and you're just like, whoa. And you're just taking notes and you're leaving here going, man, I need to do what Brandon says. I need to do what Brandon says. I kind of hypnotized, right? I mean, are we, it's fair to ask, are we kind of running the temple system here at Mosaic? And isn't the temple system, the temple model, the way that most churches are? You got a guy up there and he tells you what to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to hell. If you do this, you'll go to heaven. And how do you know, right? You couldn't possibly understand 
the text the way all of us educated people understand it. Right? So why do I say that? Because some of us, perhaps many of us, still hold on to a temple model way of thinking. And I'm just encouraging you today to ditch that. Jesus didn't come for temple model 2.0. It's not what we're doing here. I want you to just ditch that way of thinking that if I go to church, the sacred place, and if I listen to someone preach on a sacred text, then maybe I'll be okay with God. And Jesus would say to you and he'd say to me today, just as he did back then, yeah, we're done with that way of thinking. You know why? Because that kind of thinking is holding you back. So what you need to understand is that even though the temple model has trickled into the New Testament church and into this movement that we call the followers of Jesus Christ, it shouldn't be that way. And here's why. The arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model and the beginning of something greater. And something greater not for just for the Jewish people, but for everybody on the entire planet. In fact, all throughout Jesus' ministry, he calls his followers together. And he says, hey, I know you like Jerusalem. And it's a great place. And there's a lot of good things going on here. I know this is where you like to be. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave. I want you to go out. And not just to other communities, other Jewish communities and the people you know and the people that are like you. But I want you to go all over the world. And I want you to tell people to the ends of the world, every ethnic group, Every person you can find, because this is for all people, I want you to tell them everything that you've seen and everything that you've heard, because this is a message, Jesus said, for all people everywhere. So the arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model and the beginning of something entirely new and entirely greater. In fact, because of this, there would be, now get this, there would be no more sacred places no more sacred places do you know why because jesus would teach that you are sacred and you are sacred and you are sacred and you are sacred and you are sacred every person in here in fact turn to the person next to you look at him right now and say you're sacred go ahead look at i know you got a unibrow but you're still sacred I looked up the word sacred because I think it's important that we understand what that word means. If that's how God views you, if he says you're sacred and that Jesus came to to get rid of sacred places because you are sacred, we ought to know what that word means. It's how God views you. There are, as you can imagine, a whole bunch of definitions for the word sacred. But I honed in on this one because I really liked this one. This one, I think this is what... what, this is. I think this is how God sees you, all right? This is one of the definitions of the word sacred. Highly valued and important that's who you are to god highly valued and important and furthermore jesus is pointing out that when you're standing on what you consider to be the most sacred spot on the planet never be confused the person to your left the person to your right the person behind you is way more sacred to god than any piece of real estate or any piece of dirt you could ever stand on, or any building that you may ever visit. So listen, if you're holding on to the idea that this building here is sacred, it's holding you back. Some of you think Brandon may be one of those sacred men that we talked about. Listen, I've known him longer than you. He's not any more sacred than you, I promise. And he would be fine with me saying that, right? There would be no more sacred places. There would be no more special people. You would no longer need a high priest. You would no longer need anyone to tell you how to please God. You would never, there would never be a time where you need someone to go to God on your behalf and beseech God on your behalf. And the sacred text, when they're referring to here, the Old Testament would be fulfilled, Jesus said, with a single word, a single verb, because this was the beginning of something greater. This isn't like a Windows update or an iOS update. Same thing, but with new stuff, right? 
No, this is something brand new. This is something greater. It was a complete departure. And do you know how I know that? Because of this. Jesus predicted a new movement. One day, Jesus and his guys are headed up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. One city, two names, Caesarea Philippi. And they're talking about where they're heading. They're just having a chit-chat. And they know they're heading to Caesarea Philippi. And they know that Caesarea Philippi is named after Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor at the time. And everybody knew who Caesar was. And so they're having this conversation. And Jesus says, I know everybody knows who Caesar is. But I'm curious, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Jesus asked that question. And the disciples are saying, well, you know, some people say that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some people say that you're one of the prophets reincarnated. And Jesus said, okay, okay. He says to his disciples, though, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, one of the disciples, steps up. He makes this declaration. He says, I I think you're who you say you are. I I think you're the Messiah. I I think you're the one we've been waiting for. I think the whole Old Testament points to you. Uh, Jesus, I, I think you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, you're exactly right, that's who I am. You're exactly right. And God, you you didn't come up with that on your own, Peter. God told you that. God told you that. And then listen to what Jesus says next. And he says, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. In other words, on this declaration, that I am the Christ, that I am the Savior of the world, that I am the one that God sent, that I'm God in the flesh. On this declaration, I am going to build my church. That's what he means when he says, I predicted, he predicted a new movement. And that word church, by the way, that we read there in that text, in that context, it doesn't mean a place. In fact, it was never meant to mean a place. When we think of church, we think of a location or a building. And Jesus is saying, it's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about an assembly, a gathering, a movement. Jesus announced a beginning, not of a sacred place, and not of a sacred group of people who had to have some kind of inside knowledge or something. Jesus announced the beginning of a brand new movement, and this movement would literally change the world. And for many of you, maybe most of you here today, it literally changed your life. And you know what? How do I know that? (laughs) It's not because the preacher is powerful or just so eloquent with his words. It's not because the building is super cool or the band is awesome. It's because the people are powerful. Because you're sacred. And these people, this movement, this church embraced what we're talking about today. Yet still today when we hear the word church, we think location, we think place oftentimes. You think sacred space, and Jesus says, that's come to an end. No more sacred spaces. I'm going to build a congregation. I'm going to build a gathering of people, and I'll be with them wherever they go. This is a brand new day because this is something greater. You know what else Jesus did? He instituted a new covenant. He instituted a new covenant. Now, the word covenant simply means arrangement. And this new arrangement is a new arrangement with God. Before this new covenant, you had to have a high priest. We talked about that. You had to have someone go to God on your behalf. And Jesus says, no, I got a new covenant. I'm establishing something greater. The old approach to God is over. Regardless of your religion, regardless of the name over your temple, regardless of your deity or deities, a new day has come. And God has opened the way for all mankind to approach him directly. Because the final sacrifice for sin is about to be made known. And here's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, in the same way after supper, we know this as a reference to communion. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Now the disciples had to be thinking, what are you talking about? We hear it now and we know what it means, right? The disciples, this is the first time they've heard this. What is Jesus talking about? 
They, they knew they were under a covenant because God had established a covenant with Israel. And these were good Jewish boys and they knew this stuff. And they would say something like, we are, Jesus, we already know there's a covenant. We get that. Why do we need a new covenant? We already have a covenant. And Jesus would say, just hang on. Hang on. I got something greater. And tonight I'm establishing a new covenant. And eventually they stood and they watched Jesus hang on a cross, a Roman cross. They watched him bleed to death. They watched him die. Eventually it dawned on them that this is, in fact, the final sacrifice for sin, and not just for us good Jews, but for all people, for all time. And then Jesus gave new meaning to the sacred text. One day he was teaching, and he said this. And we can miss this sometimes when we're just kind of casually reading the Bible. We can just kind of breeze over this. But I guarantee when Jesus said what I'm about to read, that it got everybody's attention. I'm guessing the crowd went silent like, <gasps> did he just say that? These are the kind of things Jesus would say that would cause people to want to stone him. Here's what he said. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. This was a big statement. Jesus claimed that the entire Old Testament funneled down to him as a person. Jesus claimed that all the prophets were prophesying about him. That all the deeds in the Old Testament somehow pointed toward Jesus' arrival. And Jesus said, I'm fulfilling the Old Testament law. The law leads to me. And the law ends with me. And the Old Testament is simply a directional sign pointing my direction. Now, who would say something like that? Who would say that? And then later, looking back, the Apostle Paul would write this. He would say, you know what? Jesus was right. He was right. The entire law was like a tutor bringing us to the place where we were ready to graduate from a tutor and get introduced to our Savior. It's like the law was simply guardrails to get us to the place where we could be introduced to the Messiah the Savior of the world. And then Jesus, to replace the law, because he came to fulfill the law, because you have to have behavioral guardrails, right? Jesus says, oh, it's way more simple, guys. Listen to this. You want something else that'll blow your mind? He's talking to his Jewish friends, the crowd. He says, it's, it's way more simple than 613 laws. That's how many laws they had in the Old Testament. It's way simpler than 613 laws. It's, in fact, it's way simpler than 10 commandments. It's way simpler than that. Jesus instituted a new ethic in that moment. Because here's what he said to his followers. Don't miss this. He said, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. And when he said that, they knew exactly what he meant. They knew that this wasn't just like random acts of kindness, like open the door for somebody, help an old lady across the street kind of stuff. That's kindness. That's, that's different than love, right? Went way deeper than that. Because Jesus had just, right before this, Jesus had just taken off his outer garment he put a towel around his waist. A rabbi, Jesus, right? Put a towel around his waist and he washed their dirty, stinking feet. And they were so uncomfortable with this. These, these were the hands of Jesus that healed people. These were the hands that touched blinded eyes and caused them to see. And Jesus was gonna take these very same hands and wash their feet. And Peter said, no, Jesus, no, you can't wash my feet. You can't do it. And Jesus said, sit down, Peter, I'm gonna wash your feet. And Jesus did for them what they were unwilling to do for even each other. And then Jesus put his outer garment back on and he said, now, as I have done for you, that's what you're gonna do for each other. And guys, in this, those moments when you think that you're all that, in those moments where you think you're a big deal, 
in those moments when people sit at your feet and listen to what you have to say because they know you were with me. Guys, in those moments when suddenly you draw a big crowd because you're one of the people who, who studied under Jesus, in those moments when you think you are something, remember this night because you'll never be greater than your master and I just washed your feet. And in that moment, Jesus took the entire leadership paradigm and flipped it upside down. Flipped it on its end and they never forgot. Because the power of this movement that we call the church is not about the place. It's not about the preacher. It's about the people. This was Jesus' way of saying that when you start thinking that you're one of those sacred people, that means it's time to get out the towel and wash more feet. He said, that's what my movement's going to look like. That's what's greater. And then Jesus said to them, by this, everyone will know you're my disciples. By this. By what? Because you got a cool place to gather? Because you got a really good preacher? Because the band is amazing? No. If you love one another. And here's the big idea. That love would replace law keeping. You know what? I'll put it like this. You know in my marriage to, uh, to my wife Jenny, we've been married 31 years. Um, we have one rule. One. It's what I'm talking about here. That we love each other. Because if I really love her, then there's things I will do and I won't do. That's it. That's it. It's what Jesus is saying here. That love would replace law keeping. That self-sacrifice would replace animal sacrifice. That the evidence that you're a follower of Jesus isn't how eloquently you pray or how consistently you attend church. It's how well you love people who are difficult to love. To the point that Jesus even said that if you're at the temple and you're going to make a sacrifice and all of a sudden you realize that you're holding a grudge against your brother or there's unforgiveness in your life with someone else, leave that sacrifice there. Go. God can wait. Go make things right with your brother, with your neighbor, with the other person. That's more important. Go. Do that first. God can wait. Leave your sacrifice and go make things right. This was a total departure from temple thinking. And this, all that we've talked about today, is Jesus' way of saying, hey, this isn't the continuation of something. This isn't Temple Model 2.0. This is the beginning of something entirely new, entirely greater. The arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the Temple Model and the beginning of something entirely greater. No more sacred places. No more sacred people. Special people. The Old Testament would be fulfilled in all of its laws, reduced to a single verb. A single verb. The entire law reduced to a single verb that would be applied to God, to your neighbors, and to your enemies. And this is Jesus' way of saying, we're going to let go of something that's been holding us back. We're going to let go. And we're going to embrace something new. Something greater. In fact, you know when Jesus baptized, the Bible teaches us that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And you would think, why did Jesus need a baptism of repentance? Do you know what repentance means? It means saying goodbye to an old way of doing things and embracing something new. That's what it means. And that's what Jesus was signaling then. He said, you know what? We're going to say goodbye to an old way of doing things. It served us well. I'm not knocking it. It's good. It's been good. But we're going to say goodbye to it, and we're going to embrace something new. So here's my question for you today. What's holding you back? In fact, would you just go ahead and bow your heads with me? I just want you to have a quiet, focused time with God right now. What are the things that are holding you back? Or what's that thing that's holding you back? Is it, is it unforgiveness? Is it a grudge? Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's like, man, I, I know I need to start a relationship with Jesus, but what are people going to think?
Is it your past? Is it a relationship that's holding you back? Is it worry? Is it fear? I don't know you. I don't know what it is. But I want to give you an opportunity right now that as the band plays, that you can keep your head bowed and pray. Maybe you just confess it to God. Because here's what we know about God. He knows. He knows what's holding you back. He wants you to identify it and be done with it. And maybe today, in the quietness and the stillness of this moment, you would just say to your Heavenly Father, I want to encourage you to do this. God, help me. Just God, help me. Here's the thing that's holding me back, and I know you know it, God, but I I confess it to you now. I admit it to you now. And God, help me take a step in your direction today. We're going to sing a song about Jesus and who he is and the fact that he is greater. And as we do, I want to invite you to continue to pray and to seek him and to contemplate on who he is and what he has for you and the fact that he is greater. And we're not going to, we're not going to let things hold us back anymore.